going to begin the evening um, with readings from each of our lovely writers. And uh, Tom, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> I'm getting there. Um, I'm just going to read the first few pages of, of Adlands. Um, being the first few pages, I hope there won't be anything much to explain. Um, although the, the um, chapter heading is 1941. This is a book that um, sort of follows the seasons and and um, and the years, 70 years in one person's life, really. Um, so it begins in, in early January 1941. By four o'clock, when Idris was devouring his tea, perched between the tall spoked wheels of the wheel car, the fence no longer straggled round Flambeda Hill, but cut out almost to the heather. His wires whistled in a searching wind. He appraised the bent grass, the sheep's fescue and deep red fern of his new claimed ground. He checked for rocks with his quick black eyes, then, tossing a scrap of cake to the dogs, lowered himself back onto his smarting feet, warming his hands inside his old tweed coat before he gripped the shafts of the ransom and manhandled it over to the working horse, which was tethered to the first post and sunk. Ow! He called, ow whoop, ow whoop. Buster was a contrary animal. To catch him in the mornings took guile and diligence, hiding the harness, proffering bread, or threatening him with Albert's bicycle, which always filled him with a paralysing terror. But a horse was a horse, the highest of all animals, whatever the virtues of the sheepdog. Once Buster was hackled, he would nettle to his work. And although Idris held the joe lines and the handles of the plough, he guided him with his words alone, his voice shrill over the clatter of the tack. Short, round-shouldered, he toiled behind him up the shallow slope, one foot in the ream, the other in the crumpled fern. He watched the mountains emerge from the red-green hilltop, snow in the gullies of their long black body like a skeleton exposed. He paused at his former boundary with the common land to hurl a few stones out of the way, but in time he reached the Adlands by the green lane to Payne's Castle and lumped the plough round to face the wind, the valley and the birds already diving and arguing on the scar he had left in the hillside. That's him, Buster. That's a boy. On occasion ploughing, Idris had counted 13 different species of bird in his field. Even now there were sea crows and starlings and lapwings and rooks from the trees at the church. How anybody could think this work was lonely was more than he could understand. And then there was the pleasure of the ploughing itself of the line of the furrow falling clean and firm so the seed would sit in the ridge. The war ag paid every farmer in the country for ploughing up grazing, for putting down crops, but others left grass between their furrows. Others still had refused to comply at all and found themselves thrown off their land. Compulsory war work, that was what it meant. Idris did do his bit of usurping the common, same as the next man, but he found his defiance in precision, in a tidy job. And if his neighbours took it for acquiescence, well, there it was. The plough stopped dead in the black peaty soil. It threw itself forward so that the handles kicked out hard as a bullock and Idrix caught such a blow to the chest that it was only by grabbing the plain wire fence that he was able to keep his feet. He gasped and choked on the airless wind. His long pale face turned dark, almost scarlet. In the naked pain it was as if he'd been gassed, as if his lungs were blistering all over again. The sun was falling now between Manith Troid and the faraway plume of the beacons. Beneath the colouring clouds, Idris stood propped against the nearest fence post, coughing, wheezing, wiping the tears from his face. There were ravens in the larches round the cottage at the island, weathers out for Llinamach Pool. The sunlight in places revealed old cops and reens, the work of the deans, so his grandfather Idris had told him. It took all of the strength in his uninjured arm for Idris to push himself upright, then to hoist the plough handles level with his shoulders to allow the horse to pull it clear. The point of the share was snapped off clean. With his hand he tore at the rhizomes of the fern and peeled back the grass from a flat-faced stone a foot in the width and some six inches deep, which he tried at first to lift himself. He tunnelled beneath it, throwing up earth, but even with his boot he could not work it loose, so he trudged across the bank to the wheel car, fetched the chain and bound it round the stone, looping the hook end back through the tea head on the plough. Easy boy, Idris murmured, easy now. He led the horse slowly down the slope, the ransom dragging uselessly as the long chain jangled along with the brasses, rose with the share and came tight. The birds lapped back down their single furrow. Buster snorted, shaking his head as if bothered by flies. The muscles showed in his thick white coat. He dug up the soil with one feathered hoof and with another, 
and then with a sucking of mud and a tearing of roots the skin of the hill at last gave way the stone reared into the evening light a slab of darkness cut not formed taller than idris by a head or more his long shadow lying coldly on the hilltop for a moment before it fell at the table in the kitchen, the white jug fell from Etty's fingers to shatter on the flagstones, an ink spot of water in the last red light from the east-facing window. A moan broke unbidden from the back of her throat and grew into a lowing like a beast. Her long eyes clenched, her wide lips trembling, she sank until her face was almost in the basin and her nostrils flooded with the reek of yeast. Pain encircled her back and her belly like a noose. An urge came upon her simply to run, even in this sack of a dress, with nowhere to go and the night coming on, but her body held her as completely as the house. The clocks passed the time across the larder door. Somebody was hurrying down the boards of the landing. She looked again into the fist-shaped valleys and the lakes in the dough, which spilled and shimmered as she tried to stand. Ma'am, Etty managed, then with growing panic, ma'am. By the time that Idris had packed up his tools and lowered the long stone onto the wheel car, the first of the nightly searchlights was scouring the sky above the mountains in the south. It trailed through the cobweb clouds, pointed out Venus, found the first new moon of the new year high over the Tumpa, a dry moon longer at the bottom on the top on account of its holding in the water. Idris removed his old felt hat, joined his hands, bowed to the moon and made a wish. This done, he opened the gate he had hung that morning and, with a second searchlight now sparring with the first, patrolling a land in which he could see not one fire, not one window or headlamp, he allowed Buster to make his way home. There's a long, long trail a-winding into the land of my dreams where the nightingales are singing and a white moon beams. Bumping and slithering, the wheel car followed the track back down towards the farm, its iron snout digging up the wet ground, taking the weight from the half-seen horse. Idris sat on the head of the stone, his boots among the unused posts and wire, his bad arm tucked across his aching ribs. He sang along to the wind in the trees, the larches at the island, the hawthorns on the common and the beeches on the bank above Langadee, where the dogs were yawling into the darkness. He could have told any place in this valley simply by its sounds, by the movement of the air. There's a long, long night of waiting until my dreams all come true, to the day when I'll be going down that long, long trail with you. On the near side of the brook he slipped to the ground and, with the moon and the searchlights appearing once more from the hill behind him, led the horse through the ford and into the bottom field. In the thin, shifting light he saw the first signs of a glat in the hedge, a fresh mole tump, a ewe he'd known as Bessie as a lamb, which was rubbing on a gatepost and would need to be checked for the scab. He passed the creatures gathered round the hay cratch and climbed towards the banky piece where the farm for the fun and rose above him, loud with cattle, the wind on the roof and in the surrounding trees. The stable lamp flared, then sank into a glow as the stocking fell back over the flame. Idris had to lift it just to make out the rabbits hanging in braces, their big shadows stirring on the deep barn walls, the rant bantams roosting on the fat white beams. In the yard, the sheepdogs were wagging and whining for attention. The pig he had spared the previous month returned his look from the door of the sty, while the cattle in the beast house shouted their hunger, and the door of the stable swung and creaked, the cob gone out of his bay. Drat that boy, Idris started. He stood for a moment in the stars in the puddles, beneath the tall and blinded house, then... Hawking, spitting, he went to fill a bucket in the stone-lined phlegm which ran along the top edge of the yard. He washed the feathering of Buster's legs, unhackled the ropes and rose his supper of swedes and oat straw. He took the hay knife down from its peg, but the first sound of a motorcycle he returned outside to peer down the track at three lines of light which came blinking out of turly wood, throwing shapes like ghosts onto the trees and the hedgerows. Good evening, Mr Hamer, called the midwife, dismounting at the bridge. She stopped the spluttering engine and took her bag from the pannier. What's news? Well, well, Mrs. Prosser. Idris was looking some inches to her, to her left. Well, she were heavy on foot this morning. You hadn't seen her then? No, no, I've only come back but just. The midwife hesitated, perhaps out of pity. Oh, she said, there was a bomb fell at Bokru last night, did you hear? Oh, he said, well... Aiming for the railway bridge, they reckoned, made a heck of a hole in the Daru. Oh, Idris repeated, as if this woman were a stranger, as if they'd not sat within ten yards of one another every Sunday for the past twenty years. 
He turned his eyes another inch into the darkness and held up the lamp to light the old wooden bridge that led across the phlegm to the house. I had better follow the beasts I had. Please go on in, Mrs. Prosser. Alone, as he always had been, Idris sat in his old pine chair beside the fire in the kitchen. With stiffened fingers, he peeled back the hems of his corduroy trousers, fought with his laces and stood his boots together on the hob, their raised toes facing out into the room. He smelt the stink of his stockings, joined the smells of the oil lamp, the stew pot in the oven, the birch logs drying on the nook. He scratched his chilblains, took a swig of tea, stretched out his legs and turned his paper to the light. You are asked to plough more, he read. Bracken Motors Limited are dealers for David Brown tractors and ploughs. Let the stars guide you during 1941. If you're feeling all in after a hard day's work, hop into a life boy toilet soap bath. It'll soon put new life into you. From the ceiling came another terrible scream. Ruscog. Mr. Philip Griffiths, Pant Farm, officiated at the Methodist Church here on Sunday. Mrs. Joyce Prosser was organist and Mr. Idris Hamer, Fun and Farm, was presenter. Idris dropped the paper and folded over his knees, one hand working in the island of hair that remained on the top of his head. He breathed in gasps, groaning to muffle the sounds from the bedroom, the cries, the footsteps, the urgent women's voices, and by the case clocks that now stood either side of the larder door, some minutes passed before he raised his eyes again to the failing fire and took another birch log from the stack. He sat with his hands clasped at his chin and watched the flames revive on the log's paper skin, sending flurries of light across the embossed roses on the door of the oven, the underside of the mantel shelf, the mistletoe pinned to the black beam above him. He watched them find the splinters left by the teeth of his cross-cut saw, and soon both ends of the log were engulfed, and then the log was the fire, and Idris felt a flush of heat among the grizzling stubble and the vertical lines of his face. O oh Lord, he said quietly, O oh Lord, give me patience to bear it, and all the rest I will leave in thy hands. Thanks very much, Tom. <laughs> Daisy, when have you ready? <laughs> This is the first story, and it's called Starba. The land was drained. They caught eels in great wreaths, headless masses in the last puddles, trying to dig into the dirt to hide. They filled vats of water to the brim with them. The eels would feed the workforce brought in to build on the wilderness. There were enough eels to last months. There were enough eels to feed them all for years. The eels would not eat. They tried them on river rats, sardines, fish food, milk-softened bread, the leftover parts of cows and sheep. It was no good. They reached into the water, scooped them out, slapped them down, slit them lengthwise. There were too many eels and not enough men, and eating eels barely more than bone was not really eating at all. They burnt the eels they could not eat in piles, stood watching. It was, they were certain, a calling down of something upon the draining. Some said they heard words coming from the ground as the water was pumped away, and that was what made the eels do it, starve themselves that way. We were walking home from St Sylvia's when Katie told me she wasn't going to eat any more. She'd stopped in the road. I turned back. What do you mean? There were three years between us, and I was used to the look she gave me. I'm stopping eating, she said. I've started today. Even that first night, I thought I could see the shift in her. All the lights were on in her room, the lamps on her desk and her bedside table, the overhead, the glow from her computer screen. When she lifted her shirt to change, her spine was a heavy ridge along the middle of her back. When she wasn't in lunch on Thursday, I went to find her, ducking down to look at feet beneath toilet cubicle doors, behind the smoking shed, finding her eventually on the stile at the bottom of the school field. I'd brought an apple, rubbed it to a shine on my skirt, held it out to her. She was perched on the stile with her knees raised to her chin, not holding on. The fields were half-flooded, the way they often were. I said her name, but she didn't seem to see me, or since Sylvia's behind me, or anything else until I tossed the apple to her, striking her leg. She almost lost her balance, made a hissing sound, then thumped down and grabbed my wrist. I continued daily over that week to try and feed her. Surprising her with peeled carrots chopped into mouthfuls, chunks of melon, halved avocados. 
When she ignored them, I tried whitely iced donuts, chocolate bars, scoops of ice cream. I left the food in places I knew she would find it. On her bedside table, on the top of the cistern in the bathroom, in the drawers where she kept her clothes. I could smell the food rotting and the gushing from my window, did not need to look out to know what was there. Donuts squashed to jam explosions, browning avocados, a slick stream of leafy raspberry ripple. Katie would wrap her knuckles on our conjoining walls so I could go and hear how she'd refused biscuits, made clever excuses for missing lunch. At dinner, she would kick me under the table so I could observe the ease with which she would appear to be eating. She'd perfected it, talking a lot, chopping everything on her plate once, putting down her knife and fork to talk more and then chopping everything again and raising up her full fork and putting it down to say something else. Her movements were swift and jerking. In her bedroom after dinner, I watched her scooping food out of the pockets of her blazer, dropping it into the guttering. In a way she'd never done when I tailed her to netball practice, or balanced on the edge of the sofa while she and her friends watched films, she included me in this, her starving. The weekend was easy. We made our own lunches, ate in front of a film on Saturday night, were expected to help ourselves to the chocolate cake, the bananas in the fruit bowl, the freshly squeezed orange juice. She was mutely triumphant whenever I saw her, watching me as I ate two of everything and then rounding her shoulders in an exaggerated gag. But then Sunday, our grandmother, clipping in on high heels, balancing a mountain of almond meringue in one hand, a pot of cream in the other. The segments of the roast came out of the oven one by one, Katie sidling in to watch, holding stiffly onto the back of a chair. The chicken was trussed, brown, cracked, steaming and sliced so legs fell akimbo and the stuffing unfurled. Katie's hands were curled to mounds on the table. She was sweating across her neck, chest and forehead, her mouth open a little as she breathed. She could not keep up her patter at all while we ate, only pushed the food from one side of the plate to the other. "'What's wrong with you?' Grandmother said when Katie emptied her bin plate into the bin, refused meringue. "'Nothing. Just feel a bit sick.' I opened my mouth to speak, saw Katie's black pupils contracting, her tongue furious against the roof of her mouth. "'Go upstairs if you're not hungry.' Katie passed close behind the back of my chair, the bottoms of her feet slapping the tile floor. She did not talk to me until after school the next day, coming up and taking my hand, telling me we'd walk back the field way. She tugged me along. At the top of the stile, she hesitated, pale with sharp points of red on her cheeks, knuckles whitening, panting a little. It was over a week now. I wondered what she was running on, air or determination or anger or something or nothing or someone. We walked along the edge of the cornfield, past the canal and the tree-shadowed dirt where the older kids came to drink earth dug dug down into a fire pit at one end, the beer cans, someone's white underwear floating in the back. You won't tell anyone, Katie said, not turning back. She took my bag from me, held it over the shorn back ground. I thought about the sound the combine harvesters made working through the night. Katie shook her arms so the books and pens and hair grips fell, scattered. I shrugged, knelt to put everything back in. You won't tell them, she said. By the end of the second week, she was falling asleep, pillowed on her arms at dinner, curled on a bench at lunchtime, drowsed so deep you had to shake her. I dreaded waking her, seeing her eyes rolling into focus. She missed classes, made me miss them too, growled me in corridors so we could go and sit on the stile at the bottom of the field. At lunch, Katie's friends, mobile phones jutting from the waistbands of their skirts, cornered me in the locker room. They were tall, more limb than body. What's her problem, one of them said. There were streaks of blue highlighter in the girl's pale hair. She hasn't answered any of my phone calls. She thinks she's better than us, said another, leaning on a locker, jigging her skirt up a notch higher at the waist. Well, she's coming to Harris Ford's party, I presume, said the first, folding her arms across her ribcage. I don't know. They looked at me as if they didn't believe a word. I dawdled at the end of school, not wanting to pass on their messages or see her falter at the head of the stile, and when I got home she was there already, stood in the middle of the kitchen while mum moved round and round her, leaning in now and then to shift a strap or move a strand of hair. How could she not see it? 
The skin on Katie's arms was bleached of colour. Her mouth was a stretched line. Mum lent me her blusher, Katie said, and I could see it. Triangular arches on her cheeks. On her neck, the line of foundation was firm. The lids of her eyes darkened with eyeliner, smudging at the corners. Katie sat in the front of the car and talked and talked. I could see Mum's head nodding up and down. We pulled up outside the house. I don't want to, I said. Katie and Mum turned round and looked at me, and Mum said, what do you mean? And Katie said, nothing. When we got out, Mum leant down and put her face close to mine, pushing the end of her chin and mouth against my cheek, leaving a smear of lip salve. You okay, Suze? Something wrong? I looked at Katie. She was on the grass leading up to the house. There was music coming from the open windows and she was dancing. I looked at Mum and shook my head, waved at the sound of the car moving away across the loose gravel. When we went inside, I tried to ignore Katie. My friends were there and we sat and watched everyone else. Some of the girls were draping themselves over chairs, lounging with intent. We knew what they were doing arranging their bodies so their legs were at the best angle, so their faces offered the most flattering side. We would do it too if we had the courage. There were boys at the party, some of whom were at the sixth form college and had car keys and hair on their chins. Mostly the girls didn't talk to them, only turned in their direction as if they were magnets. In the corner of the room, Harris's older brother was holding sway with a beer in one hand and a roll-up cigarette in the other, and Katie sat on the arm of his chair. Harris's brother hadn't been to university, worked the mechanics his father owned, had tan lines cut around the edges of his clothes and didn't say much of anything. I could feel my friends ignoring Katie for my sake, and I ignored her too, but eventually there was nowhere to look, and eventually she was on his lap. His hands up her top, someone said. I didn't need them to tell me. Later, when Katie took Harris's brother into the bedroom and closed the door behind them, the whole room was timing their absence. Some people shifted closer, laughing and drinking, trying to hear. My friends and I played fuck, marry, kill, kill, theoretical five minutes in heaven, imaginary spin the bottle. There was a story people always told about a girl who used to go to our school and, they said, lost her virginity to a bike. We marked the outfits round the room out of ten, judged the older boys with what we considered harsh, critical notes, talked about our crushes. Look, one of them said. Harris's brother opened the door to the bedroom and came forward. He was carrying something in his arms, a blanket or length of piping. Except when he put it down next to me, the head on my lap, it was Katie. Where are her clothes? There was something in his face I wanted to draw out and strangle. He held onto her hand and then dropped it. Where are her clothes, I said. I started to take my jumper off, struggling with the arms. A lot of the girls in the room were laughing, but I could see one picking up a coat from a bundle and hurrying over. I looked down at Katie. Her spine was now a great, solid ridge, rising from the mottled skin of her back. The webbing between her fingers had grown almost past the knuckles and was thickening. Her face had changed too, her nose flattening out, nostrils thinning to lines. I woke in the night, on the pull-out hospital bed. Mum was next to me, Dad was asleep on the chair. Katie put her hand around the drip in her arm, tugged it free. We walked along the corridors. With each step, Katie made a panting sound. In the bathroom, she stood under the shower with her eyes open, her mouth parted to catch the cold water, lip it up. She was, she said, dry as a bone. She stood there until a nurse found us, me curled beneath the sink, watching her. You'll kill yourself, the doctor said. Katie blew bubbles from the side of her mouth. In the day, they force-fed her. At night, we walked along the looping corridors, circling and circling. In the bathroom, I listened to the sound of her, coming out red-knuckled to stand under the shower, drinking gallons of water so her stomach swelled mountain-like out of her ribs. Her skin was dry like paper, the hair on her head falling out in handfuls. She couldn't walk any more, only hauled herself across the floor, belly down. We could not hear when anybody, she could not hear when anybody spoke to her, watched mouths, shook her head. When mum and dad weren't there, I held up signs for her to read, moving closer and closer until they were a hand's width from her face, and still she squinted, shook her head. Why won't you eat something, I wrote, and she held the paper to her nose, tried to eye each letter at a time, sucked her thick bottom lip into her mouth and then let it go with a pop. We were in the hospital a week. 
I sat in the corner of Katie's room and watched how everybody tried not to see what was happening, though it was clear. It was clearer than ever. Her hands were not fingered now, only heavy, unwieldy paddles she used angrier every day to knock over trays of food, dislodge her IV. They kept giving her oxygen. I wanted to tell them it wouldn't work, but it was, it was no good. She was drowning in air. At night, I brought her bowls of water, lowered her face in, watched the bubbles, saw how she came up just about smiling. Nights, she rolled out of bed, flopped her way down the corridor on her belly, searching for something. I followed her at a distance. They took to tying her to the bed, straps around her middle, her forehead, her ankles. She ignored our parents, looked blindly for me. I knew what she was asking. They knew there was nothing they could do for her. We took her home. A nurse would come every day to feed and clean her. Katie locked herself in the bathroom and would not come out. Sitting on the floor by the door, I heard the sound of her in the bath, the water sloshing out, the slap of flesh on plastic, the sound of the shampoo and conditioner bottles falling to the floor. When mum broke down the door, we stood and looked at her, but only I would stay, sat on the floor, patting messages through the surface of the water, pushing her under so she could breathe. The ambulance is on its way, Mum shouted up at the, up the stairs. Katie rolled her head to look at me, moving her long body in the water. I wet a towel, lifted her free, carried her out through the back garden, under the hedge and into the field. Her face next to mine, the thrash of her excited stomach against my side, the flapping of gills shuttering on the side of her neck. I carried her as far as the school field, paused at the stile to rest. The canal ran deep there, was mired over with weeds and nettles. I lay her on the ground, jerked her free from the towel, pushed her sideways into the water. She did not roll her white belly to message me goodbye or send a final ripple, only ducked deep and was gone. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Fiona? So I'm also going to read from um, the beginning of the book. Um, it, I mean, it, it shouldn't require too much explanation, but the first couple of pages are on a different, slightly different time scale from the rest of it. They, um, they occur just after the end of the book. Um, and I'm including them just because I don't usually get to read them because they're, they're sort of um, out of the, the kind of linear narrative a bit. And I'd like to read them. I cast no shadow. Smoke rests behind me and daylight is stifled. I count sleepers and the numbers rush. I count rivets and bolts. I walk north. My first two steps are slow, languid. I am unsure of the direction, but in that initial choice I am pinned. I have passed through the turnstile and the gate is locked. I still smell embers, the charred outline of a sinuous wreck. I hear those voices again, the men and the girl, the rage, the fear, the resolve. Then those ruinous vibrations coursing through wood and the lick of the flames, the hot dry spit, the sister with blood on her skin and that land put to waste. I keep to the railway tracks. I hear an engine far off in the distance and duck behind a hawthorn. There are no passengers, only freight. Steel wagons emblazoned with rogue em emblems, the heraldry of youth long grown old. Rust and grit and decades of smog. Rain comes then stops. The weeds are drenched. The soles of my shoes squeak against the grasses. If my muscles begin to ache, I do not reckon with them. I run, I walk, I run some more. I drag my feet, I rest. I drink from alcoves into which the rainwater has pooled. I rise, I walk. There is always doubt. If she turned south when she came to the railway, there is no use. She will never be found. I can walk or I can jog or I can sprint or I can just stop in the middle of the tracks and lie down and wait for a train to cut through me. It would make no odds. If she turned south, she is lost. But I chose the way north, so that is the way I will go. I break all bonds. I step through the margins of fields. I scale barbed wire fences and locked gates. 
I cut through industrial estates and private gardens. I pay no mind to the lines of counties and boroughs and parishes. I walk with a paddock or pasture or park. The tracks take me between hills. The trains glide below peaks with dales underneath. I spend an evening laid out on a moor watching the wind, the crows, the distant vehicles, caught in memories of this same land further south, earlier, another time. Then likewise caught in memories of home, of family, of the shifts and turns in fortune, of beginnings and endings, of causes and consequences. The next morning I continue on my way. The remains of Elmet lie beneath my feet. Chapter One We arrived in summer when the landscape was in full bloom and the days were long and hot and the light was soft. I roamed shirtless and sweated quite cleanly and enjoyed the hug of the thick air. In those months I picked up freckles on my bony shoulders and the sun set slowly and the evenings were pewter before they were black, before the morning seeped through again. Rabbits gambled in the fields, and when we were lucky, when the wind was still and a veil settled on the hills, we saw a hare. Farmers shot vermin, and we trapped rabbits for food, but not the hare, not my hare. A dam, she lived with her drove in the nest in the shadow of the tracks. She was hardened to the passing of the trains, and when I saw her, I saw her alone as if she had crept out of the nest unseen and unheard. It was a rare thing for creatures of her kind to leave their young in summer and run through the fields. She was searching, searching for food or for a mate. She searched as if she were a hunting animal, as if she were a hare who had thought again and decided not to be prey, but rather to run and to hunt, as if she were a hare who found herself chased one day by a fox and stopped suddenly and turned and chased back. Whatever the reason, she was like, unlike any other. When she darted, I could barely see her, but when she stopped for a moment, she was the stillest thing for miles around, stiller than the oaks and pines, stiller even than the rocks and pylons, stiller than the railway tracks. It was as if she grabbed hold of the earth and pinned it down with her at its centre, and even the quietest, most benign landmarks spun outrageously around, while all of it, the whole scene, was suckered in by her exaggerated, globular amber eye. And if the hair was made of myths, then so too was the land at which she scratched. Now pocked with clutches of trees, once the whole county had been woodland, and the ghosts of the ancient forest could be marked when the wind blew. The soil was alive with ruptured stories, that cascaded and rotted, then found form once more, and pushed up through the undergrowth and back into our lives. Tales of green men peering from thickets with foliate faces and legs of gnarled timber. The calls of half-starved hounds, rushing and panting as they snatched at charging quarry. Robin Herder and his pack of scrawny vagrants, whistling and wrestling, and feasting as freely as the birds whose plumes they stole. An ancient forest ran in a grand strip from north to south. Oars and bears and wolves, does, hearts, stags. Miles of underground fungi, snowdrops, bluebells, primroses. The trees had long since given way to crops and pasture, and the roads and houses and railway tracks and little copses like ours were all that was left. Daddy and Cathy and I lived in a small house that Daddy built with materials from the land hereabout. He chose for us a small ash copse, two fields from the East Coast Main Line, far enough not to be seen, close enough to know the trains well. We heard them often enough, the hum and ring, ring of the passenger trains, the choke and gulp of the freight, passing by with their cargo tucked behind in painted metal tanks. They had timetables and intervals of their own, drawing growth rings around our house with each journey, ringing past us like prayer chimes. The long indigo adelantes and pendolinos that streaked from London to Edinburgh. The smaller trains that bore more years, with rust on their rattling pantographs. Old cart horse trains chugging up to the knacker. They moved too slowly for the younger tracks and slipped on the hot rolled steel like old men on ice. On the day we arrived, an old squaddy drove up the hill in an articulated lorry filled with cracked and discarded stone from an abandoned builder's yard. 
The squaddy let Daddy do most of the unloading while he sat on a freshly cut log and smoked cigarette after cigarette that Cathy rolled from her own tobacco and papers. He watched her closely as she spun them with her fingers and tipped tongue over teeth to lick the seal. He looked at her right thigh as she rested the tobacco pouch upon it and more than once leaned over to pick it up, brushing his hand against her as he did so, then pretending to read the text on the packet. He offered to light her cigarettes for her each time. He held out the flame eagerly and took offence like a child when she continued to light them herself. He could not see that she was scowling the whole time and frowning at her hands as she did his work. He was not a man who could look and see and understand faces well enough. He was not one of those who know what eyes and lips mean or who can imagine that a pretty face might not be closed around pretty thoughts. The squaddy talked all afternoon about the army and the fighting he had done in Iraq and in Bosnia and how he had seen boys as young as me slashed open with knives, their innards a passing blue. There was little darkness in him when he told us this. Daddy worked on the house during the day, and in the evening the two grown men went down the hill to drink some of the cider the squaddy had brought up in a plastic pot bottle. Daddy did not stay long. He did not like drinking much, and he did not like company, save for me and my sister. When Daddy came back he told us that he had had an argument with the squaddy, he had clouted the squaddy about the head with his left fist, and now his, he had a bloody nick in his skin just by the thumb knuckle. I asked him what had started the argument. He were a bastard, Daniel, Daddy said to me. He were a bastard. Cathy and I thought that was fair enough. Our house was laid out like any bungalow or park home on the outskirts of any smaller city where old people and poor families live. Daddy was no architect, but he could follow a grey and white schematic rustled from the local council offices. Our house was stronger than others of its type, though. It was built with better bricks, better mortar, better stones and timber. I knew it would last many dozen seasons longer than those houses we saw on the roads into town, and it was more beautiful. The green mosses and ivies from the wood were more eager to grip at its sides, more ready to pull it back into the landscape. Every season the house looked older than it was, and the longer it looked to have been there, the longer we knew it would last, like all real houses, and all those that call them home. As soon as the external walls were up, I planted seeds and bulbs. The earth was still open from the foundations Daddy dug. I extended the troughs and filled them with compost and fresh manure we got from a stable eight miles down the way, where little girls in fawn jodhpurs and shining leather boots rode ponies around a floodlit gymkhana. I planted pansies and daffodils and roses of all different colours, and a cutting taken from a white flowering climbing plant I found spewing out of an old dry stone wall. It was the wrong time of year to plant, but some shoots came up, and more came the following year. Waiting is what a true house is about, making it ours, making it settle, pinning it and us to the seasons, to the months and to the years. We came there soon before my 14th birthday, when Cathy had just turned 15. It was early summer, which gave Daddy the time to build. He knew we would be finished well before winter and there was enough of a structure to live in by the middle of September. Before then we made our home from two decommissioned army vans that Daddy had bought from a thief in Doncaster and driven to the site down back roads and tracks. We hooked them together with steel rope and tarpaulin was stretched over the top, expertly and securely, to give us shelter beneath. Daddy slept in one van and Cathy and I in the other. Under the tarpaulin there were weathered plastic garden chairs and after some time, a sunken blue sofa. We used that as our living room. We used upturned boxes to rest our mugs and plates above the ground, and to rest our feet too, on warm summer evenings, when there was nothing to do but sit and talk and sing. Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, so one of the things that is incredibly striking about all three of these texts is that they're, they're completely absorbed in the landscapes in which these stories take place. It's almost unimaginable to posit them as being anywhere else. So I wonder, what was it in particular that drew you to these landscapes? Tom, which you... I'm sort of hypnotised <laughs> because um, I'm sort of hypnotised on, on in these two uh, alien to me landscapes now, so I have to drag myself back into my own. I didn't realise that this was going to be a peril of reading first. Um, well, 
I grew up in Radnorshire, um, which is part of Powys in, in Mid Wales, um, where, where I, I, I wrote another novel that was set there, a novel called The Glass a few years ago, and, and um, when I wrote it, I, I didn't really realise that nobody else knew that Radnorshire existed. In fact, I had a conversation with an academic um, guy from um, London University one time, and we were talking quite seriously about it in literary terms, and I realised that he thought it was a place that I'd invented. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, I suppose in the, it was nine years between those books, actually. Um, and so I, I, I suppose I spent a long... I, during the, that whole process, um, because um, it's, it's incredibly difficult to answer succinctly, actually. I mean, like you don't really choose what type of writer you are or mm. where you write about you you just try and make the best of what you've got really <laughs> um and um as i say i mean i grew up in this place and and um and i feel about it very very strongly and every spare second i have i'm off pursuing some sort of peculiar arcane detail about it and i very very rarely leave mid wales <laughs> This is quite an anomaly, um, uh, and um, so I'm assessed by it. But but you know, basically, when I first started writing seriously, when I first had the moment when I th when something happened to me and I could see the words on a page in a way that I'd never understood before, the waiting, uh, the the weight of the words, the the music, the inflections, every kind of detail of them suddenly, you know, revealed to me. Mm -hmm. And that was writing. That was a piece of writing which was set in 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 the landscape of Mid Wales. And and I've I've been. And at the time, I think I kind of fancied myself as being something of an urban writer or something like this. Um, in any case, slightly more commercial. <laughs> and um, and I slowly had to come to terms with the fact that where my writing lived and and uh, was 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 within this landscape. And so. Um, the process of my writing life, in some respects, has been trying to work out what to do with that and how to how to digest that landscape and how to describe it. And in the case of Adlands, it was to do with a lot of it was to do with um, with with trying to write from the inside out. I mean, those books that are well known about that part of the world. I mean, principally, I suppose people would know Bruce Chatwin's on the on the Black Hill. I mean, these have very much been tended to be written from an outside point of view. And um, as, um, I mean, Chapman was a travel writer and writes of the Welsh borders as a tra travel writer and of its people as in some way exotic. And even people who you might say are more of the place, like R.S. Thomas, he does, he does something similar. He sees, he, he very much objectifies the people who are there. So among the things that I wanted to do was to, was to write from the point of view of the place and of the people of the place rather than of incomers or passers through um, yeah. as it tended to be the way. I can go on about this for hours, <laughs> so I just shut up, you know. <laughs> how, how much did you try and write about somewhere else? How long did that take you? Uh, <laughs> to get out of it? <laughs> um, I did write one novel set in 19th century Russia and I learned a lot about that. I, um, among, among other things, I learned how difficult it is to write about someone that you know intimately. I don't know, some of you, you know, I, you, know uh, what, you may have thoughts about that. Um, but, I mean, as I say about that, you know, not even, you know, starting with the presumption that people would know what I was talking about and realising that not only would they not know half the language that I wanted to use, they wouldn't have a clue where the place was, probably. Yeah. Um, and so those presumptions that you can make is you're trying to communicate, you're trying to tell a story to people, and so you have to make, you know, you have to make, you have to make presumptions about what the, the other person could understand. Whereas when you're writing about 19th century Russia, um, it's an entirely, entirely different picture. Um, but I, I, I felt that I was sort of... Uh, it was uh, writing about this landscape was clarified by doing that, by yeah. going away, by going so far away in time and space, um, coming back to it. Suddenly, I was sort of able to see this landscape as it were as a place for story, which is the key mm. difference, really, making it your own, if you like, um, uh, rather than you know, if you if you look, if you if you feel too kind of hemmed in by the the actual place, there has to come a point at which you break from that and which you turn it into a dramatic landscape in which. You, you do as you please. You have to yeah. feel you have to you have to feel that freedom really. Yeah. It's a strange paradox, isn't it, that uh, 19th century Russia seems closer to us than Wales. <laughs> well yeah. Well I, I think in a way it's because there are more precedents. I know you know, I mean 
you know, put it very simply, if you if you describe some fog and say you're in a place called Hangman's Wharf, mm. you know where you are. Everybody knows where they are instantly. Yeah. You know there's an opium den around the corner and everything. <laughs> if you're writing something set in Radnishire, nobody knows where Radnishire is. Mm. Nobody cares where Radnishire is. Yeah. You have to start from the ground up. You have to, you, you know, you have to make this a centre of a fictional world, somewhere which is not central to mm. anybody else. And... And that's very difficult, and you have to find a relationship with the place in order to yeah. to, to make that work. Mm. Um, and with nineteenth century Russia, you do have those precedents. Mm. You know, you do. You have the scale. It's a place for drama. Naturally, you've got bloody wolves. You know, if everything's colder and hotter and richer and poorer and everything, it's a place for drama immediately. Mm. You know, um, whereas you're dealing, you know, in mid Wales with with shades of grey to some extent. You know, yeah. and you make of that what you can. <laughs> So Finland as well. Finland, more well known, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I think it's well known. It's um, like an area between Cambridge and Norfolk, um, which is very flat. Mm. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think my story is probably similar in that I spent my teenage years there, as you may tell. Um, that is not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I uh, had this same feeling of why would you ever write about the place you grew up? Um, you know, you leave it as soon as you possibly can. Um, so I tried to write other things. Um, I was trying to write a very long novel um, and then started doing uh, the creative writing masters and started trying to write short stories. And um, this story that I read to you like appeared um, and in it was the landscape which I'd um, come from. And I think it was made for what I was trying to write about. So the fen is it's kind of, um, it used to be all flooded um, and they pumped all the water away to make it into farmland. So it's this incredibly dark land, um, really, really flat with the roads sort of above this dark farmland. Um, so there's something already slightly apocalyptic about this, this idea that it's like the least likely place to flood anywhere because they have such good flood defences, but you feel like the water is always going to come back. Um, and then the stories made sense to be set there. So actually going back, um, I think, was the best thing I did. And I think also... I don't know about you, from growing up in that land and then leaving it, my memories are all sort of tinged with that slightly panicked um, teenage feel. Um, you know, lots of, like, booze and blood and, like... <laughs> um, <laughs> which <Wow>. I... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and those stories are all about that, I think, about being a young woman um, or a woman of any age and growing up somewhere, um, mm. and particularly somewhere rural and what that does to you. You know, particularly before you can drive, what what is it like growing up somewhere like that? <laughs> yeah. So you wrote them, you weren't living in the Fens when you wrote them? No, I was living in Oxford. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's something vitally important, isn't there, about memory intervening in this process. So do you think you could have written them while you were in the Fens? Would that have got in the way? Yeah, I think, I, I think people say that a lot. I think you have to get away. Mm. Um, and for me, I had to be in, I think, somewhere so, a city, somewhere so yeah. different from that. Um, and be a bit older um, but I did feel like so as I was writing these stories I started seeing there's a lot of foxes in the novel and I started seeing these foxes around the city um, I don't know if it was the same fox but every time I went outside of, outside of my house a fox would be there gradually getting closer <laughs> um, <laughs> which made me feel like the fen was sort of impeding upon Oxford mm -hmm. um, but I think I had to leave it because I also had to see it in this very dramatic mm. way that maybe living there I wouldn't have been able to do yeah, yeah. And what about yourself and Fiona? Uh, so, yeah, it's a very similar story. Um, this this is set in the landscape of, of home. Um, I mean, I grew up in, in York, so in the city rather than mm. in the countryside. Um, but the school that I went to, its its catchment area was very much in the kind of the south of the south of York. Um, so it's an area I know very well. It's an area that I, I cycle in with my dad. Um and I was living in London when I started the book, and when I ended the, when I finished the book, I was I'd moved back to York. Um, so it's it's a kind of story of of Yorkshire and London in a way. Um, I think that one one of the things about it is that I consider myself to be from this part of the world, but I wasn't born there, and mm. a lot of people, you know, who are Yorkshire born and bred, would would sort of 
you know, question question my identity there, and certainly my accent fluctuates wildly. <laughs> um, you know, when I'm reading this, I become very Yorkshire, and, and people say, "Oh, that's not how you sound when you're giving interviews." Um, <laughs> You know, or when you know when you're talking to you know your publishers yeah. in London, and I say, well, it is it is my voice. It's just another version of my voice. Yeah. You know, I do yeah. kind of fluctuate between um, a kind of Hackney accent, which is where I was born, and a Yorkshire accent. Mm. Um, so I think, I mean, and this this book is about belonging and about land and fi- finding a place in the world. So I think um, I think I was writing it because because it is the landscape of home, but it's it's you know it's not my original home or it is my it's my found home or or something like that um but yeah no it's it is all very familiar and uh, i always have to kind of emphasize that it's not autobiographical which i think a lot of novelists have to do with their first work because Mm. there's there's an assumption that with your your first novel is always going to be more or less about you um Mm -hmm. and this isn't (laughs) that said uh, you know when i read it more and more when i sort of go back to sections I, i do kind of and um, you know, when my mum read it for the mm. first time, she realised that it, there was there was there was more to it than at first met the eye. You know, there there I was just remembering earlier today that there's a bit in the novel where there's a mention of somebody stealing a tractor and driving it through a barn, and I don't just mean through the door of a barn and out the <laughs> other door. I mean through the, through both sides of the barn. You know, destroying the barn, and that's something you know a lad at my school. <laughs> did that he he, he stole a six formers uh, moped drove to a local farm stole the farmer's tractor yeah. drove it through the barn stole the farmer's car and drove the wrong way down, down a motorway yeah. like, so, <laughs> so that was kind of you know they were yeah, it isn't autobiographical but it's, it's only kind of one step removed you know it's, it's mm. talking about people on the margins of society I'm not on the margins of society in any way but you know that the, these people are only, you know, a few hundred meters away, or or yeah. just you know a, a step mm. removed. So, um, yeah, landscape of home, I guess. Yeah, I wonder if at this juncture as well you would uh, care to explain Elmet. Oh yeah, so um, Elmet is the name of the old um, Celtic kingdom. I say, you know, as as a medieval historian, I have to put Celtic in inverted (laughs) quotation marks because, you know, it's a problematic term. But um, it was it was a Britonic kingdom um, which survived for quite a long time. Um, And although the area was taken over by the Romans, it kind of had its own cultural identity and it rubbed shoulders with uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and then also um, Danish kingdoms. but it, it, it remained Elmet and it remained culturally distinct. It, it sort of kept its Celtic um, mm. heritage. Um, so I wanted to to give the novel a kind of a name which rooted it in, in the history of the place. Mm. Um, and that's why I chose Elmet. Yeah. And of course, I mean, it's quite hard to escape Ted Hughes at that point as mm. well, isn't it, with remains of Elmet and Elmet. Book called Elmet as well, didn't he? Which was a yeah, well, revised version. It's um, yeah, and 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 Ted Hughes is 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 there there in the um um at the front of the book. Um, I I hadn't actually read um the remains of Elmet when I when I when I wrote this, yeah. so I, I I read it kind of I guess I was I was drawing to an end, you know, I was about mm. three quarters of the way through, um, and yet it seemed seemed very familiar. Mm. So it's not a case of being directly influenced by it in the sense that I'd already <laughs> written a large chunk before before I read it. But I mean, I, th- I think you know, I think his poems <laughs> must have influenced me subliminally yeah. in a way. Yeah. I don't know, that sounds a bit sort of um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. airy fairy. But um, yeah, no, Ted Hughes is definitely there. But he, he, his element. I mean, he's talking more about. It's a bit further north. It's the sort of more glamorous kind of Calder Valley and the and the area mm. where the Rontes are from. Whereas this is a little bit further south, but it's it's the same idea. Yeah, and I wonder, sort of, it's slightly related to this. How much of your writing about each of these landscapes is a way of laying claim to it? Yeah, I think I think that's fair to say. Um, I think it's certainly to do with finding a relationship with it. I mean, you know, we're dealing with you know, home to some extent, but I mean, certainly in my case, I've always tended to have quite an ambivalent relationship to it. Mm. I mean, um, you know, I went off to university and so forth. I mean, basically, Mid Wales is an agricultural working class community. It doesn't really, there are no centres of higher education. 
um, you know, most people with ambition go somewhere else. And, and yet I found myself kind of compelled to, I didn't really find it. I was happy unless I lived anywhere else. Yeah. I certainly didn't, I certainly couldn't write when I lived anywhere else. That was just my experience. I found when I tried, when I tried to write and live in London, I, it was as if there was just sort of head noise going on at all times. I never managed to write a single sentence in those times when I tried to live in London. And, um, um, so it's to do with trying to make peace with those things, but there certainly there is a kind, there is a sense of of of, of laying claim as well. Well, laying claim, or rather, uh, asserting really. It's not not so perhaps not so much about me as it, as it is as it is about trying to assert the place and slightly. I don't know. I sort of feel as if it's doing ju- to try and do justice to it mm. really. Um, and to try and make it try and make it a place in which people I mean this is this is something that I feel quite strongly actually. Some that a place in which, you know, people growing up could feel that it is somewhere that's worthy of having stories told about it. Um you know, um I remember watching a cartoon with my son when he was about five or something or other and it and it, the images began at the beginning and he said, Oh, it's set in London again. And I and I just sort of felt well. I would like him to grow up thinking that this place that he comes from is somewhere that is worthy of stories mm. being set in it. And and actually, above and beyond that, I mean, I I, I really feel that that approach is one. And I'm delighted to have this conversation um, for many reasons. But among them is the fact that I there are so many so many places which don't have stories told about them and there's so much to say about those places and those people are equally valid and 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 should be reflected and if you if you like sort of honored in that way and taken seriously in that way and so that's a very important thing to me yeah and it's something actually that if you want to draw attention to briefly in the excerpt that you you read is that all of these places historically did have their stories that they were very incredible local stories that slowly got homogenized into a national culture um and it's something of that of laying claim to that historical uh, narrative route as well isn't there Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think one of the, the the other main reasons I wanted to call it Elmet was just just to suggest that, or to remind people that the boundaries of the landscape have not always been the same, mm. and they will not always be the same. Um, I mean, this is a book that's very directly about um, laying claim to land, in that they that is exactly what the characters do. They build a house on land that they don't own. Mm. Um, so it's very much about ownership um, and about draw, drawing out, carving out boundaries, artificial boundaries. Um, and I think... Um, so I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I, no, I, I think... I think um, yeah, laying, laying claim to the land is at, is at the heart of this, I suppose. That, that, that's, that's interesting to, to me, I mean, just as a sort of resonance. And I mean, this, this book is set within about about four miles of the Welsh border, but the only thing that I knew, we, Daisy and I were talking about this before, about what you know before you sit down to write and so forth. I, the only thing that I knew apart from this vague structure was that I wasn't going to use the word Wales or England or border anywhere in the entire book because everybody who's ever done written about the border harps on about the border and uses it to sort of underpin divisions in the character and the sort of dy- dynamic dynamic of the story and and that simply isn't how it is in reality the border is a sort of arbitrary line really and um i mean it's becoming in a sense more important now because you have different councils on either side of it and so forth but but that is a line that has moved and moved and moved and there's been and within writing in wales about the welsh bo- um, borders is tended to be that you have the, the the Cymru on the one side who are original and who have always been there, and on the other side you have the Saxon hordes who have arrived and um, really ought to go away sometime soon. And and this is simply it, it's simply not in any way a true reflection of what the Welsh border is, or indeed, I mean, and the line is basically sort of arbitrary, really. And that um, and it, this is a you know that Radnorshire and that that part of the world, obscure as it might be, is a part of the world which has interacted with the rest of the world as it always has done it is uh, one of the things that i was kind of interested in was to do with authenticity and originality and and these ideas that play into the culture like hill farmers particularly like you know say in iris thomas you know these 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 are people that iris thomas describes his 
Pharma Yaga Pradhak as having been there since time began. And there's very much those, those associations, those sort of archetypal associations with hill farmers. So all of that stuff is there to play with, if you see what I mean. And it's a, it's a sort of constant dance between those different ideas. So we all seem to be, I suppose, um, I don't feel like I personally wanted to lay claim to the land. I mean, I've, I've left it and my family don't live there any longer. But we all seem to be laying claim to the kind of people who live in these places. Mm. Um, you know, the kind of people who live in very, very rural areas, all the characters in these books are quite isolated, um, quite like weird, I suppose, in their own ways. Um, I think I wanted to lay claim to um, women in rural areas. Um, so all of the characters in the book are female. Um, and they're all wrestling against, um, in some ways, men, in some ways, also kind of um, wildness. Um, you know, what we do to the landscape um, and if the landscape had a power, what it might do to us. Um, and I think you maybe get those in all these books, the landscape kind of, um, yeah, because you're, you're both writing characters who are either farming or who are trying to live in a not traditional house and what the landscape kind of, how you do that, um, which is quite difficult, maybe. Yeah, uh, there's something uh, beautiful about the way it's very quietly predicated on that, anthropic original sin of reclaiming this land that we're not supposed to be on. Oh, nice. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> it, seems to, it seems to disturb people in, uh, constantly throughout these stories. I think there's something about this all the way through with each of these texts is that um, there is something uncanny about being in the land, isn't there, that's going on. It seems to have this power over us, and yet at the same time all of these characters are pushing back against it or through it? I mean, how conscious of this sort of thing were you mm -hmm. writing? Well, I can answer that, but I've sp I feel like I've spoken quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, one, one thing I will say... <laughs> one thing that I will say, sorry. I, OK, so the, the farm in the... Well, the central farm is called the Funnon, which is spelled F-U-N-N-O-N, which is a sort of anglicisation of the, of the word. But um, it's... Um, it's it's it has a spring at the farm and and uh, and a small church next to the farm like various farms around that I know and um, and um, I do find an ex extraordinary power in those places um, that there are yew trees around the church there which are sort of two thousand years old and therefore sort of predate Christianity and the I that idea of the sacred in the landscape and of power in, in of, of of a particular mm. power in the landscape the force that it has on oliver the central character and is is um he he belongs there he is the shape of the valley he he find well, on the in the one brief occasion when he tries to leave it's 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 a disaster he simply mm. doesn't know what to do mm. um and frankly the more time passes the more i feel like that <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose yeah. there's something, um, maybe you can comment this on a medieval context as well, that if we go back historically, there always was that thing. If you think of poems like Sir Orfeo and Sir Gawain, that going mm -hmm. away into nature and that being otherness mm -hmm. and violence and elsewhere. I mean, <coughs> were you conscious of that with Elmet as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, particularly in medieval literature, the forest is seen mm. as, a, as a kind of other world, and that's... That's true of the medieval literature of uh, across the British Isles, whether it's written um, in Middle English or indeed Old English or Welsh, um, Middle Welsh, I should say. Um, <laughs> um, th th there's a sense of if you, if you go into the forest, things change. Mm. Um, you know, the the the, the expect the rule the rule of law. Uh, is is somehow different. Um, you might encounter fantastic beasts. You might come back somehow changed yourself. Um, you know, time works differently. Um, mm. Is also true in the kind of um, the Parsifal sort of story. Um, I, I I was conscious of that, and I mean, in, in the opening, I, I mentioned Robin Hood, um, and that's working with a very it's, it's working with a very specific notion of of what the wood or what the forest is it's a, a kind of uh, in in the ballads of robin hood it's um a hunting ground set aside for it's owned by the king and it's it's um it's illegal to to hunt venison in the forest so there's a whole kind of sense there not only of 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 it being a kind of mystical place but also actually really very very worldly in the in mm. the sense that it it's bound by the law um 
and I think those are the two things that I wanted to suggest a little bit um, yeah. with this book, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense, yeah. I wonder sometimes if we're in danger of uh, romanticising the landscape with a small R, the sense of... Mm. And this isn't something that's new to literature, something that's gone through all of the merry England of Renaissance literature and then what grows out of the enclosures, the reaction against that, particularly mm. in Romanticism, then mm. that sort of uh, antithesis towards the city in 19th century literature and we arrive at the wasteland and mm. obviously with equal criticism now and all mm. that, that sense of ecology, how much are we in danger of, of imposing too much on it, anthropomorphising the landscape? Yeah, I think it's a real danger. And I think one of the things that, you know, I, I write sort of um, about, you know, I, I'm, I'm romanticising the landscape here, mm. absolutely. But I think one of the, the things that I really wanted to do was was to root it in this kind of, <laughs> this legal battle. I mean, it's not a legal battle, but this, this battle over, over land. Because mm. no matter how much we romanticise the landscape in this country, it's always... Um, it's always kind of mediated by who owns the land and who mm. who has access to the land, um, and we we can't overlook that. You know, if if somebody is sort of w walking around on a on a more writing mm. writing sort of <laughs> romantic with a, a small r poetry about it, you know, what what are they doing there? Who, you know, why do they have access? Yeah. Does everybody have access? Yeah. Um, these are questions that I think it's really important for, for writers to consider if they are going to, to deal with nature and landscape as a, as a subject. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say maybe we're going the opposite way of um, romanticising the landscape. I think at the moment there's so much, you know, apocalyptic fiction. Mm. Um, there's a really good um, Hilary Mantel book, and I can't remember what it's called, um, but the beginning is um, two pages describing sort of the British landscape and its motorways and, you know, like skinny ponies and dirty fields. Um, and I think writers at the moment are really enjoying doing that, you know, kind of making the landscape dirty and dark and taking advantage of it in that way. I think maybe we're moving mm. away from the romantic landscape into something different, you know, like a contemporary landscape, um, which is being um, infringed upon. Um, so it's not the way it used to be. Yeah. And was there a sense when you were writing these books of, of the landscape fighting back or would that be too much of a anthropomorphization on the landscape is how did you feel about this where do you start um, <laughs> um actually i really don't know where to start on that it's mm. um uh, i mean adlands is a word which me which is it's like a radish of pronunciation of the word headlands meaning the last part of the field to be ploughed and this is, and the farm of Funnen is sort of in a cleft of a valley, a narrow cleft, and is surrounded on all sides by the, by bare hills, by empty hills. And so, in 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 regard to kind of what Fiona was talking about before, it's that there's there's a sense that what's going on in the hills is where the la the stories and so forth take part place. But there is also this, this 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 threat that it represents because their their survival is so precarious. Mm. Um, they, this is an extremely difficult farm to live on. It's it's basically untenable, really. I mean, it's it's surviving ultimately only by subsidies, in the way that so many of these farms are. And then what happens, you know, say during the foot and mouth crisis, which there's a there's a chapter about that in the book. And there's 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 a, there's a passage which I, at a time which I remember distinctly in, in 2001 when the um, when the the sheep left the hills and suddenly you saw saplings coming mm. up everywhere. And um, and I remember people saying, being interviewed, farmers being interviewed, saying, you know, we need this support. We have to get things back off the ground again, or everything will turn into a wilderness. Nobody sort of really said, well, you know, went further than that. Wilderness seemed to be the ultimate line in it, in a way. Yeah. And and I think, in a sense, that there's there's something of that threat in there as well. There's a question of, well, why the hell are you trying to scrape out a living in this place, mm. in this corner of ground? Um, and the, the, the constant year-on-year -year precariousness. And then those changes which take place in the 70 years that I describe. I mean, when, when people talk about... I, I, I went, uh, you know, I've known a lot, a lot of farmers over the years, but I went sort out a lot of particularly ancient farmers. I think the oldest I spoke to was 100 and had been on the same farm for 96 years. Um, and he'd been playing with horses into his 50s. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm talking to them. Okay, what were the great changes that have taken place during the course of your life? And 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 that 
the the most common reaction would be of of three would be, well, electricity and tractors and silage. Mm. The silage is perhaps not the most obvious of those, but you, you know if you think that every year survival through the winter is dependent on on um, on 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 the hay crop and whether or not you're able to dry the hay out. The fact that you're able just to wrap the grass in plastic and put it aside and you don't need the weather, you're no longer weather mm. dependent as to whether or not you survive through winter. The most enormous change. And so there is, a, you know, there is this kind of constant threat. The landscape, the landscape, the weather and so forth, the natural world, if you like, is a constant um, um, antagonist and, and uh, you know, so it's, th- there is this constant relationship, this constant dynamic, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Fen, in a very physical way, the landscape is t- uh, turning around and attacking. Um, so the foxes are talking um, and uh, attacking all the farms. Um, there's a story where an albatross comes and takes someone's baby away. Um, and this was not something I thought I was going to address, but which kind of kept appearing. Um, and I suppose is uh, the landscape answering back. A lot of the collection is about giving characters who don't have voices um, language so language is really important um, uh, and that doesn't always work out well language in the collection kind of turns against the people who are using it um, I liked what you said about um, landscape being uncanny mm. um, and I guess the uncanny being you know the landscape is our home but it's not a homely place um, and the idea that we're not so what I always notice when I go home um, my parents live in the middle of nowhere um, is how quiet it is and then you start listening and you hear everything in a way that you don't in cities. Um, you kind of hear the foxes uh, killing all the rabbits. Um, <laughs> uh, and, yeah, the, the landscape actually is quite scary. I mm-hmm. think I wanted to um, bring that out in the collection and this kind of feeling of, um, so it's set in an imagined town um, and I wanted there to be sort of a rising sense of panic that what happens if things start going bad because the landscape is answering back to all of the things we've done to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you raised language as well. Um, How conscious were you of the landscape shaping the kind of language that you used in these these books? Um, Are you thinking particularly of the the dialogue? Well, so the dialogue is one thing, but also, I mean, just even in the descriptions Mm -hmm. that you have of of various places. Yeah, I mean, it's... I I definitely used dialect words, Mm. but kind of sparingly because my experience of people in in that part of the world is that that you know young people do use dialect words but actually they're not they're not speaking in sort of a, a Yorkshire language from a, a dictionary of of Yorkshire sayings <laughs> um they're just as likely to to you know use words from tv as they are mm. um you know to say e by gum or think, in yeah. fact they won't they're not going to say e by gum <laughs> <laughs> or or the like um so yeah, I, I, there are kind of bit, bits and pieces of, of dialect words, you know, local names for things. But this it is a it is a contemporary book, and um, and the people are, um, you know, in in a way that the, the central family are a little bit rootless. They're they're actually, um, you know, they they build a, a house house here, and they're sort of sort of from here, but they've spent a lot of time living over by the coast, and you know, they're mm. they're they're without a, a permanent home, which is the whole the yeah. whole point. So. So you know their their language is kind of um, skewed a little bit. Mm. Um, so that's what I, I was trying to do. Yeah, I think it's it's funny w- that you say this this uh, sort of departure of the Yorkshire accent mm. amongst young people. It's I mean it's increasingly the case, isn't it? But if you go further back, you can actually map a really beautiful topography topography of accents, and it mm. works almost perfectly. If you go somewhere like Manchester, which is, tight and nasal it has that tight nasal accent you go even as far out as Macclesfield it suddenly becomes so much more rolling mm-hmm. it's the same in Yorkshire West Yorkshire where you have the Pennines it's a much more up and down accent mm. you go out further west further east sorry it gets a bit flatter yeah and it's really it's, sorry carry on no yeah I was gonna say you know it is really noticeable and I and um I can tell you know if, if you're local to the place you can really spot those differences I can mm. definitely pick out a Leeds accent as, as distinct from a York accent yeah you know, a, a York, a York is the, the city has a, actually a really um, very nasal kind mm. of Yorkshire, and it's and it's, I guess, somewhere between between Le- the Leeds accent and the Hull accent, as you'd expect. But I can definitely tell when someone's from from Leeds, and it, that's only you know down yeah. the road. Um, so I did I did want to convey that um, mm. 
a little bit and and you know I re- when I was writing the the dialogue because I, I changed spellings a little bit which mm. was something I really wrestled with for a long time because I sort of feel like you know English spelling doesn't actually relate to how it's pronounced anywhere in the country so if, if you're going to if you're going to change the spelling of a word you're almost making a you, you're making a statement about who owns standard yeah. English spelling yeah. you're saying that that's owned by by people you know who who work for the BBC mm. so I, I didn't want to at first and then I realized that if I didn't change the spellings of some of the words people from different parts of the UK wouldn't hear what I wanted them to hear. Yeah. So it was really a practical thing in the end, and I went through the whole book and and, and, and changed it for mm. that reason. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, when they write Yorkshire accents, there's like a T apostrophe for, yeah. you know, like yeah. going up the hill. <laughs> no one, <laughs> no one <laughs> says that. They, yeah. they just miss, they, they miss out the the. Yeah. Um, and for me, the most pronounced thing of the particular Yorkshire accent in this area is the, the, con- the con- sort of condensed... Uh, word ending so it's mm. couldn't rather than couldn't and wouldn't and yeah and things like that. And so it's a, yeah i suppose part of this is a measure of how confrontational you want to be about it because irvine welsh i mean for instance was very head-on about saying i want you to hear this in mm. a voice that's alien to your own mm. when he was writing things like train spotting i mean we are conscious of this of pushing landscapes onto people pushing different areas of the country onto people yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i do, i mean i did it quite deliberately I, I mean it must be said the passage that I read which wasn't the full first chapter but it was a largish part of it I mean that's 1941 the land the the dialect really the Welsh English um dialect there well, which is a hell of a lot to say really but th- but it's um principally it's a sort of language of pre-mechanized agriculture really so the things that it's describing are very often farming techniques some of which remain and some of which most of which don't and um but also the landscape and in terms of describing the landscape you have these what 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 i really wanted to do is to write on the terms of the people if you know what i mean and you know you're you're suggesting that rather than you you, you know as, as fiona is suggesting I, you can't it's 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 to do with giving the right impression to some extent to putting across the people in the way that you want to put them across i mean Idris at the beginning there would have used thee and thou rather than you and your and so forth. I mean, it's it, but if you start theeing and thouing, it starts. Yeah. You know, there are associations with that. There, you know, people might very well go who are in the, uh, but you put who are there, and suddenly you've got, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. you've got all of those associations. So you're sort of navigating all of those associations, trying to put things across in a way that is alienating to some extent because you want. This is a separate place. This is not a place that you know. That as the kind of presumption that I was making, mm-hmm. it is a and it is a place unto itself, and this is a place on its own terms. But you have to communicate that at the same time. But within that, you know, you have local words which, when when you start thinking along those lines, suddenly you, you realise that not only do they apply very specifically to this landscape, which is which is a which is a great thing because they're so they're so they so precisely describe what you want to describe. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I mean, like, let's say there's a word weepy for a particular type of wet ground. Mm. I mean, I, that, some, of, some of the words are, are, are so evocative and so easy to, uh, so easy to understand. You don't, you don't need a glossary for words like that. So, to, so, to, so um, I, I found it a joy to work with them, actually. I found yeah. it a joy, yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't it, 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 yeah. it, you'll find Seamus Heaney actually even steals one from different parts of Ireland, he's... Poetry isn't one of mm. his words. Bleb mm. isn't one of his words, mm. but he sort of requisitions it as a kind of, oh, well, this is my yeah. dialect, I'll take mm. that, because it is so evocative, yeah. But also, actually, I mean, there is a universality about it. I mean, it, it's sort of the paradox, if you like, that I'm sort of trying to explore being on the edge and being the centre of a fictional world and all of these these, these sort of paradoxes which, which run through the book. Um, among them is the fact that, you know, this this dialect is very specific to the place, but I've, but I've come across... Many examples, you know. In fact, I was doing a um, talking to a Scott on um, uh, about this book on um, Tuesday night, and he was remarking on how many of the words were familiar to him from Scots, mm. and some of them I knew already, but others he pointed out. I mean, clake, for example, to mean chatter in in Scots is the same as clack in Welsh, yeah. it's from clack, meaning to, yeah. to gossip in 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 in. Um, in Welsh, so you know there it, there is a sort of universal British quality about it, as well as it's being extremely specific to that particular time and place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, uh, I think interestingly, as a reader and reading these books, I didn't notice the dialect or feel like it was pushed upon me. Mm. Um, Fen doesn't have any dialect in, but it does have quite a lot of swearing in, um, <laughs> which was a very purposeful thing that I wanted to do because we all swear, um, and these characters in particular are sweary people. Um, and I was doing a reading in America, and I said, I'm not even going to say the word, it's only a word, but um, I said the C word, and this woman on the front row flinched, <laughs> kind of physically, <laughs> like, ah! Um, so I didn't read that story again. Um, but I wanted to put those in because... I thought it would be weird to not putting them in, you know, thinking the word and then, you know, putting like bloody hell or something. Um, <laughs> and I felt the same way about um, the sex in the book. I feel like in a lot of books and a lot of films, you know, like the characters will meet in a bar and then you'll see them going back to a bedroom and then there'll be like a weird black space or like in a book, a weird white paragraph. And then they'll have just had sex. They'll be like lying in bed. <laughs> um, but no one ever writes about it. And I really wanted... I guess, yeah, push to push it on the reader because mm -hmm. um, uh, that's what happens. Um, why would you not put it in, I think, in the same yeah. way that maybe, you know, these um, places do have dialect. So to not put it in would be, you'd be having to think, oh, I'm not going to put it in, which yeah. would be a strange thing yeah. to do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder, Daisy, if you tell us a bit more about um, how you thought of the landscape as dictating and shaping the characters. Um do you mean in a negative way as a writer? Well, not necessarily in a negative way, but just sort of in the sense that these people are of this landscape. Yeah. Um, I think their characters feel, a lot of the characters feel negative about the landscape. Mm. Um, a lot of the characters feel like they've been born somewhere um, or they've ended up somewhere and they're never going to escape this place, which I think is maybe some of the way some of us feel about the place we were born. Um, yeah, it dictated, I think, a lot of the characters are isolated. Um, even if they have families, um, a lot of the characters are kind of quite aggressive or quite angry. And I think that maybe came um, from, yeah, from the landscape, not from the fen as it is, but from the landscape I, cre I decided to create. I'd created, yeah. you know, an apocalyptic landscape um, so the characters couldn't be any other way than they were, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose both of your novels as well have these tall um Aggressive, perhaps, is maybe the wrong word, but incredibly physical and quite often violent men. How mm. conscious of you was this? Was this something necessarily shaped by the landscape in particular, or is it a reaction to it? Yeah, I mean, for me, in some ways, Oliver, the, who's born at the beginning of the book and lives for 70 years of the rest of it, he's, he's, he, he, he's almost, in some ways, he's, he's an embodiment of, of the place for me. Mm. Um, and a sort of digestion of its history and so forth. I mean, he's 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 not a real person at all, but I did have this set to with a neighbour of mine when I lived up in the Ellen Valley for a long time, over a car. I spent two days in the company with this bloke. And I was absolutely fascinated by him. And I just, he's, so he, he's, um, he's, he's, Big guy, best known for his fighting, um, and dressed with sovs, so lots of sovereign rings, and big golden sunglasses, face all smashed up. He's about 70 odd. Um, dyed hair, big, this strange golden waistcoat, strange, you know, and, and this reputation for, 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 for violence, and yet strangely passion for um, Songbird, songbird preservation, but he, um, <laughs> I, I was absolutely intrigued by him immediately, and and initially it was just a sort of visceral thing. But I, I, you know, since then, I think one of the things that interests me about him is that he's, uh, is that uh, when I saw Oliver first, I, I saw him sort of in the door of a pub, and he'd be coming to the pub, and he would be, he's, um, he's a local legend. He's. Mm. Everybody within five miles can tell you, oh, about that time he threw a man off a bridge and oh, about that time when he stuck someone head first through a police car window or whatever it might be. Um, but at the same time, he's never really been outside of those five miles. Mm -hmm. And within Oliver, there is a sort of an awareness of his own importance, but his, also his complete irrelevance. And that's the sort of... That was the tension in Oliver that I, I always sort of knew somehow he would wind up there, although I had no idea how. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it is something like that. And that's probably to do with my relationship with it as much as anything. Mm. The fact that it is, it is the most important place to me in the world. And yet I, it's completely irrelevant. And I know that. And, and there's something very generative about that. Um, mm. f for me, I, I, it's, it's a tension that I just, 
I, I'm just always working through somehow. Yeah. 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 And Fiona, what about Daddy? Yeah. I, first of all, I, I really like the, um, the the idea of importance and irrelevance to describe <laughs> um, a man like that. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, and the character of Daddy is is kind of similar similar to that. He is very deliberately from a, a different age. So I don't think uh, he necessarily was sort of born from the landscape as such. He was he was mm. born from from myth, you know. Yeah. Um, he he's improbably large, you know, not just not just kind of big, but mm. but really really enormous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know for some reason I've always been kind of fascinated by men like that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, yeah, it's a it's a very particular kind of masculinity, I suppose. It's it's um, it's a very old kind of masculinity. Um, there's, I think, I think Daddy, in in his, his single person, I, I I wanted him to kind of epitomise the negatives of masculinity and also the positives. So mm. he is, you know, in the positive sense, he's extremely reassuring. He's this sort of huge, strong father figure who's gonna you know, do anything for you and look after you. And then, of course, he's, you know, hugely troubled and, yeah. and violent and he, he, he can't sort of work out how to how to live in the world outside of his, his violence. Mm. Um, but I suppose I wanted to write about him because as well as being about landscape and people responding to their, their physical surroundings, they're also responding to the particularities of their bodies. Um, mm. And I think there's probably a parallel there, or I wanted there to be. Um, you know the the three characters, the three main characters in this in this this book have very different bodies, um, and sometimes their bodies fit with their person. Sometimes people's bodies fit fit with their personalities and their their senses of themselves. Yeah. Um, but that's not really the case here. Daddy kind of does, but mm. but Kathy, the daughter, sort of takes after her father in in temperament. But mm. she's not built like him, of course. You know, she's she's just a girl. So where does all this kind of energy go, and how does she follow in the footsteps of her father without having his his physique? Yeah. And equally, Danny, who's um, who's the narrator, he's he's a boy and he's going to grow up to be a man, but he mm. is in, t in terms of his temperament, he's nothing like his father. So so what's his place going to be? And then equally, the daddy character, you know, he he's looking at his two children who he loves, who he adores, and he he thinks. How can they possibly survive when they're so physically weak? Mm. You know, it, it, his world is entirely defined by strength, um, by his muscles. So how how can they how can they possibly survive? So I think, you know, there are these three people looking at each other. You know, there's a, there's this sort of tr trinity at the heart of it where they're kind of looking. You know, how do you work? How do you work? Mm. I can't understand you, and they're all trying to understand each other. And I think the thing with Kathy as well is that there isn't an obvious role for her within that landscape as yeah. well. As I mean, so he can go there, he can build a house, he can sort of lay claim to this land. Uh, she could do that, mm. but the opposition that she'd face would yeah. be tempered by the fact that she's a woman. Or was he younger at that point? But yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I mean, and and she's sort of trying to latch on to role models. And there's a, there is a woman, there's a woman called Vivian who she can't see as a role model because she's so very different from her. Again, um, and she latches on to these these images of, you know, like for some reason as a society we have a real fascination with kind of beautiful murdered women, mm. um, and this this goes back a very long time. <laughs> this goes back millennia. You know this kind of fetishization of of the woman who's been killed, but she's posed beautifully, in a beautiful way. So so Kathy kind of becomes fixated of all these sort of images that she sees in newspapers or stories. She hears of these women who, who just sort of they're just the victims of violence, you know, and that's all that they can be. And she she sees her body developing. Um, I mean, there's a line, you know, I don't, I don't want to quote from my own book. <laughs> I guess I am here talking about my book. So yeah. there's, there's a line in it where, you know, she, she says, oh, we, we all grow into our coffins mm. or something like that. And, and that's, what she's, that's what she's seeing. She, you know, she's developing this body of a woman and the only woman that, the woman that, you know, the only role for women that she sees in this landscape is to be kind of um, the victim of violence. So, yeah. so that's kind of her, her greatest fear, I suppose. Yeah. And it's interesting this thing of uh, it, it shaping a person over time as well. Ted Hughes said something really nice about when he was a boy in Mythamroyd walking up to the moors and being up on the moors and hunting with his brother and then coming back into the town. 
He says that for me was where the division between body and soul began, which is quite a nice way of looking at things. <laughs> a lie, no doubt, <laughs> but it's a nice way of looking yeah. at things. And that sort of brings me round to the last thing now I'll, I'll ask you, which is about um, time. Because one of the things that Hugh talks about with these characters in, in Elmet, um, it's a fellow called Crag Jack, and similar to what you suggested about these local legends, he talks about him having his, uh, his nose and chain anchored by a longboat, as if the Vikings had just arrived and shaped his face. And I think one of the things that's striking about landscape literature is that it does seem to open up this much vaster space in terms of time, doesn't it? I mean, not to mix my <laughs> temporal and spatial metaphor up there, but it's a much larger canvas, isn't it? And I suppose you know, with a generational novel, it's hard to imagine a generational novel being carried out in the same way in a city. Uh, this is a sense of uh, the primordial that's lurking in Fen as well, and also with Element, this sense of ownership and time going back through that and these characters that have been there for that long. How conscious were you of, of time and this sort of different way of being in time? Well, I suppose that I'm aware that writing out of Wales, you haven't really got a lot of geography to play with. Um, mm. And and, um, and certainly if you're talking about this, the sort of people I'm talking about. So in a sense, a generational novel is, is one of the only ways in which you can get the span, the, you know, that you... you, you that, give it the, the book the size that I would feel satisfied by but I mean beyond that I mean the book I'm writing at the moment I'm I'm, I'm sort of I've, it's no longer realism and, and um, sort of all things in history are happening simultaneously so mm. it's possible to go over the mountains from 21st century town and um, past a 19th century house and to a 14th century Cistercian abbey and, and, I, and I sort of feel that well what we have in Wales we we may be very limited in some respects, but what we have got is history, and we have got and 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 I think it's, um, I'm, I mean I'm fascinated by those things, but I feel very strongly that I want to draw on them. And in in um, so in 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 Adlands, I mean Oliver is informed by the place and by the landscape, and in a sense, although it never mentions the border, the conflict, the history of conflict is written there into the landscape. I mean it's there in the form of ruined castles and in terms of you know ancient sort of animosities between farms and villages and so on and different sides of the river and everything like that um and so everybody is built out of the history of the place and um that's my experience of the world in fact yeah. um and um, but you know i i think if you if you zoom in and you focus on a place like that you see these things perhaps more distinctly mm. yeah. yeah um i suppose Firstly, there's the thing you said about um, these are all landscapes filled with stories. Um, and I think uh, these are all landscapes which are all kind of have a lot of folk tales about them, a lot of myths that come from them. Um, a lot of Fen was inspired by myths, you know, kind of the old metamorphoses, myths, um, uh, people changing into animals. Um, and the landscape in those is, myths is always kind of changeable as well. Um, secondly, I think... Uh, yeah, I think you're right. The landscape does have a timelessness about it that the city doesn't, perhaps because you can write landscape without um, those sort of uh, time checks you have. Mm. So um, a couple of stories in Fen, you know, they use um, OK Cupid, which is like a dating app, um, or they use their telephones. Um, some of the stories, they don't have phones or laptops. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to make it feel like um, these people knew each other, but they also could be at any point in time at all. Um and to have, yeah, to have that strange feeling that you sometimes have when you're in a landscape that you could just be there forever and ever. Yeah. Um, and that perhaps very little apart from human influence would change it. Um, I think there's something quite weird about that. Um, and I felt uh, even in Adlands that you're looking at a generation and things change, particularly like new rules come in or new attractors come in. But there's always something quite similar about the landscape. Mm. Um which I found really compelling um, and also quite heartbreaking, I think, that um, you can live in this place and you're changing or trying to change, and but around you everything's quite the same. Um, mm. I think I wanted to try and convey that. Yeah. Yeah, I think... I think Daisy's just articulated everything that I was. Thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was... Yeah. yeah. No, but thank you. You articulated <laughs> it much better than I could... Um, yeah, that, that exactly that, um, and I, yeah, um, I, I too found that in in both of these other books as well. Um, 
I am just reminded of. Uh, so one of, one of the best things about the, this whole, the whole uh, experience of having written this book is is meeting Ali Smith. In fact, and she she we we were asked we were doing an event and she was asked we were asked this question and she said and I'm you know I'm not going to do her words justice but it was just the most amazing response and she said oh yeah well you know we did, time isn't linear and we were like oh wow cool and <laughs> and she said um oh and you know she said it much better than this <laughs> um because you know we are ev every moment of our lives living in our memories and we are living with our future expectations and our hopes and our dreams so we're living in the present and we're living in the past and we're living in the future all at once mm -hmm. um and that was a that was a cool thing that ali smith said so <laughs> <laughs> thanks ali smith yeah. <laughs> um, so i wonder if this juncture uh, if anyone has any questions yeah um i just did my homework i read things <laughs> the other week um, I was interested. I was, I was very struck by the theme of sexuality in it, and I think that ties in with what you said about women and, and wildness. And there was also that theme of sort of danger and transformation. And I was wondering if that perhaps compares to maybe in the urban environment, sexuality and sex is more sort of caught up in commercialisation and sort of artifice, and in this sort of wild, slightly weird landscape, that to become something else. Yeah, interesting. Um, I suppose in in the wildness you don't have as many images of yourself which you do what that's kind of what I notice when I come to London is like you know you go down on the tube and there's like a mm. massive poster being like get your bikini body and you're like fuck off <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah in the fans um what they've got is sort of referring to one another or like referring to their mothers um or kind of just doing it without knowing what they're doing you know so their sexuality it is sort of maybe animalistic um, in a way that it isn't in, in fiction about the city, if that answers your question. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Can I ask you about the characters in Elmer's? You've got Daddy and Danny and Kathy, and you wrote it from Danny's point of view. Mm -hmm. Was that important to, to make it from his point of view? Uh, yes, because um, he's the, the least active of the three characters. Um, Daddy and Kathy are the doers. They get stuff done. Um, Danny watches. He, 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 he's kind of in the sidelines a little bit. Um, he's also the most um, re reflective character. Um, he spends the most time thinking, so um, he kind of naturally makes a better narrator. But, you know, the, the, subject, the subjects of the book are, are Daddy and Kathy, really, and, and Danny is important, but he's... he's he's important because of what he sees um, um, rather than necessarily his journey. Um, and also as I was writing, Danny, Danny was formed, uh, Danny was formed as I was writing. So I always had Kathy and daddy in mind and Danny kind of, he, he came to be um, as his story progressed. Um, so he became much more real um, uh, as, as I went along. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, for places that you all have sort of grown up in or lived in for a long time, um, you obviously know them intimately, but did you find um, the need to sort of research any particular aspects of, or uh, did you feel sort of confident writing what you were writing? Um, I... Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of indoorsy person who really wishes I was an outdoorsy person, <laughs> which I think is true of a lot of people who write about nature. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, really, I really wish I was the kind of person who knew loads about woodland crafts. Um, well, I tr or tried to learn about those things because I think they're really, really cool. Um, and I'm afraid that it's not from first-hand experience always. So I did do a little bit of research along those lines and then also I did research into um, some bare knuckle boxing which required watching lots of videos of uh, you know illegal videos on YouTube of um, men in muddy fields fighting each other which were usually recorded on you know like a camcorder and VHS and then they've been uploaded to the internet um, so that was <laughs> that threw up some some great search terms um, <laughs> Um, I, I think I went back a couple of times to try and um, remember it. 
Um, and then uh, I wikipedia quite a lot, um, which was very helpful. You know, sort of, um, so what happened when they drained the land? I wanted to vaguely know that. Um, yeah, mostly I think what I took from the land was kind of just the image of it. For anybody who's been to the fens, it, it kind of stays with you. It's almost, it's kind of almost like a strange... Um, it's like when a photograph doesn't work because there's the white sky and then there's the black ground and you almost think you've made a mistake in seeing it like that. Um, so I kind of just wanted to take that and try and thread it through. I didn't want to research it too much. Um, I'm also a bit of a rubbish researcher um, and luckily nothing in the book needed too much research. Um I read, I read a lot of myths to try and, yeah, get that idea of how to do, how to do something weird. Um, my research, I guess, was just reading as many other people as I could and trying to like, like suck them in. <laughs> um, so reading short stories and seeing, uh, you know, how does someone possibly do this in such a small space of time? Um, and how do you write something really weird while also keeping, um, a domestic sense I really wanted it to feel like this is something that could happen to us you know in a, like everyday life yeah yeah I, I did do an enormous amount of research but um but at the same time it's hard to sort of distinguish that from what I might have been doing anyway I mean when I get a weekend off I suddenly find that I'm sort of bothering archaeologists in Strata Flor Florida Abbey and or something like that and and when I do get a day off I, I was I'm always moaning that I don't get any days off and then when I do get a day off, I think, oh, brilliant. And I'm, you know, in a lead mine in the Cambrian Mountains. <laughs> or, um, uh, But I particularly, I mean, most of the research, I, I mean, I do do some specific research. I, I'm not, for example, to regard to the beginning of this book, I'm not, a, um, you know, a, 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 a hill farmer in 1941. I don't know how farming practices worked at that time exactly. They're different. You know, and it has to be precise, and so I have to know. And but at the same time, you know, there's no better. It's, I had a job at one point when I was doing a thing called a day in the life for the Bracken and Radnor Express years ago, and um, I only got it because the person who was doing it got pregnant, and I just covered it for a bit before they didn't have enough money to pay anyone anymore. But as a license to go to just bother anybody. What's it like being an Indian waiter in Rehda? What's it like <laughs> being a, you know, what's it like being a, you know, farmer in the most remote house in England or Wales? What's it like, you know? And, and well, one thing I discovered is that you're mostly quite keen to have a conversation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, well, by the time this book was published, there were four of the farmers who I went to see and had long conversations with that died between that time. And I, and I, and I really felt that I was sort of, you know, bearing witness for them to some extent because their stories would be, you know, those experiences would be lost otherwise. And um, But just, you know, in that case, I wasn't really doing the bracket or anything for, for the money. It was like, you know, it's a licence to be nosy, really. It's a licence to go and say, OK, you know, well, I, this is my excuse. Will you talk to me? And, um, you know, I sometimes wonder whether I don't do it for that as much as for the writing or, you know, which way round it works, you know. Um so uh, so I love it and can go on about it for at length, like many things. <laughs> that, that really chimes with me. I, I like that a lot. I, I think writing is mainly about seeking people out to have conversations with them mm. and, um, and taking a, a genuine interest in people who are not like you at all. Mm. Um, that really chimes mm. Yeah, with absolutely, me. absolutely. I mean, I just think uh, that thing of imagining lives quite entirely like your, unlike your own. I mean, it's a, I, you know, that's the point, really, it's, yeah. It's like a Joyce thing, isn't he? He said he never met anyone that he didn't find interesting. Yeah. Which I don't believe, but yeah. it, was, <laughs> it sounds plausible enough. Have we got any other questions? Yeah, one at the back there. Um, this question for Daisy, I just wanted to pick up on um, something you mentioned earlier about uh, kind of very deliberately wanting to give voice to the women um, in this landscape. And I think, you know, it's an impression I have, and I could be completely wrong, but that kind of rural fiction or kind of pastoral tradition or whatever you want to call it is quite like male dominated and masculine but then again there are like lots of exciting contemporary British female writers like Sarah Hall and Evie Wilde who are kind of writing about women in these landscapes and sex and sexuality and I was just wondering where you kind of see Fen fitting in or kind of reacting. Whoa um yeah so Sarah Hall and Evie Wilde were exactly who I was reading oh, yes <laughs> at the time of writing it um 
So I, yeah, I set out to, you know, um, from the f- writing the first story, I knew that I wanted these um, stories to only have women as protagonists. Um, Sarah Hall um, often gets asked this question where um, people are like, why are all of your protagonists women? And she says, um, um, I'll stop doing that when you stop asking me that question, um, which I think is a really good answer. And I say it every time. <laughs> um, where do I see myself fitting in with them? Yeah, I think they're both doing, as you said, that a thing with... Um, placing women in wild places the women are often really isolated um and it's interesting that the women are often uh not all of Evie Wilde's but all of Sarah Hall's women are extremely sexual um she writes about sex all of the time and there's a kind of question of like why does she do this and I wonder if it is a response to you know um old um old (laughs) old men writing about nature um in a way that in highly removes uh, female sexuality um, and I think there's a real good exciting gap to fill with that and I think that's why reading those people is really exciting because they're doing something different um, and I think maybe at the moment what they're doing um, seems shocking um, and you know but I think that's only because people aren't writing about female sexuality um, why are they doing it in the wilderness or yeah, it, might, it must be that kind of like repopulating this place with something new, trying to like rewrite it. I think that's what I felt I was trying to do. I was trying to like rewrite something um, and give these women a voice. That was very rambly. I hope that was a, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Should we have one last question? So, um, yeah, it did have an emotional impact, and some of the the more visceral passages were ones um, that I wrote from uh, start to finish, you know, uh, in big, long chunks of writing, um, which wasn't the case for much of the rest of the novel. Um, I think I set set out to want... I mean, for for me, the purpose of a novel is is to combine intellectual and emotional stimulation, and that emotional stimulation has to be physical. Um... I think the the idea that you can read something and have a physical response is absolutely fascinating, and it's something that people have been fascinated with, you know, as, as from from the minute that reading began. You know, people in the Middle Ages were fascinated by the idea that you could you could read something and it could have this sort of this real you know real effect on you. Um, so, in any piece of writing I that that I do, I want people to. Um, you know, either laugh, which you know there aren't many laughs in this book, or, or, or sweat, you know, or pant. Um, I want to elicit that reaction because, you know, for me the whole point of fiction is that, that those emotions are drawn out so that the kind of, the 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 intellectual element that's there is kind of given this this new kind of timbre, I suppose. Um, so. Yes, there, there were there were really violent passages in the book. Um, I mean, it's a book about bodies, so I, there needed to be something visceral, and it just happened that that those visceral em- elements were violent elements rather than, for example, sexual. Um, but yeah, um, what was your question? Did it affect me? Yes, it did. <laughs> it did, and and I'm I'm glad that it affected you because that's exactly what I wanted it to do. So thank you. <laughs> Smashing, there we go. Good bit of violence. Um, so, at this juncture, it's time to say thanks everyone for coming. I don't know about you, but I've had a lovely time. Um, so, again, if we could just say thank you to our lovely authors, Fiona, Daisy, and Tom. Thank you. Thank you.